very nice afternoon uh, to all of you who came this afternoon to a special celebratory lecture by Dr. Gunnar Pedersen. Um, I'd like to welcome our present and past um, students who are here with us. Some of them are with us in person, some online. I'd like to also um, welcome academic, non-academic staff, past and present of Newbold College, who can be here with us today, either again in person or online. And um, it's very good to have um, college and church administration as well to participating in this lecture. They made space in their meetings to be present. And I'd like to say something. I find it very encouraging to make this welcome uh, to an audience like this. Um, to me, this gathering illustrates what the church should be, at least in its one of its main functions about, also about, about listening and learning. The medieval church has created a major gap between the clerics and the lay members. It was only the clerics who taught and the lay, and the lay members were supposed to only listen. Um, one church was the teaching church, so to speak, and the other the listening or learning church. And all the power and influence was in the hands of a very small group of people who influenced the big majority of the church. But the biblical image of the church is an image of one body with various functions and various gifts. And that one body is one church together, which is alive because it is nurtured by Christ and enabled to function by Christ. One body coming together. I like this image in the Bible. Um, the biblical church invites and seeks nurturing by being a listening and learning church. A community that is defined, in a sense, by listening and learning. I'm encouraged to see such, such community here today. Uh, we are happy um, that we have today Dr. Gunnar Peterson with us. For those who are maybe less familiar with uh, who Dr. Peterson is, I'd like to say that Gunnar has been a lecturer in systematic and biblical theology at Newbold College for 17 years. Gunnar was called to teach theology in 1995, and he retired from full-time teaching in 2012. Gunnar has, however, not retired from active speaking research and academia, and uh, even this semester he's teaching for Newbold College a master's course uh, called Leading Motives in Adventist Theology. And I'm very pleased to welcome Gunnar and also his family members who are here with him today and who traveled from, from Denmark. The format of the seminar will be such that Gunnar will have his presentation, after which we will take some questions, and after which we will have just a few short speeches. Gunnar, thank you for accepting uh, the invitation to present today. It took, I have to say, some encouragement um, and some time to bend his hand, um, but I'm very pleased he has done it and that he has eventually agreed to speak to us. Welcome, Gunnar, and please. Yeah, as Jan was saying, you know, it took some persuasion. And uh, I thought I was just going to give a lecture in a small classroom somewhere, and uh, there would be a few attendants. But thank you for coming anyway. I have given it the title, A Personal Journey into Adventist Theology. For lack of a better title, that's what I chose. I have a subtitle, which basically I call Reclaiming Biblical Eschatology because I believe that reclaiming biblical eschatology is the raison d'etre, or the reason for the existence of the Adventist church, and Adventist theology. And this is the genius of it. This is where the source is. And any other rethinking that we have ever been engaged in, in terms of theology, it is caused by our eschatology. It's a revolution in Christian theology, and you should be aware of that. Now, Luther and the reformers, they initiated what I call a revolution in sociology. That is, 
to reclaim the biblical teachings on salvation. This is basically what we are talking about. Adventists initiated a revolution, or should I say Millerite, or the Millerites and early Adventists initiated a revolution in eschatology. That is the biblical teachings regarding human destiny and how God is going to handle the future. The last things, as we sometimes call it, then we understand it. And thus, it claims to be continuing the Reformation break with what we could call a Hellenized Christianity, as N.T. Wright would call a Hellenized Christianity, because we are not entirely alone about this. This seems quite straightforward. Uh, it seems just let the scripture tell its own story on its own premises. That's all that's to it. But it's not as easy as we think. My own journey into Adventist theology began in earnest with a crisis that was unleashed 50 years ago by Desmond Ford. In the 1970s, until that time I had been studying theology, now I began to do theology, if you know the difference. His speech at Pacific Union College in 1979 deeply challenged the core of Seventh-day Adventist beliefs. It did. There was a tape circulating, and uh, he spoke like a machine gun for two hours, and you were completely dazed having listened to it. And it took a few days to recover. <clears throat> now, uh, he claimed that it was the very gushing, Adventist eschatology is the gushing fountain of, uh, should I say, uh, the Adventist distortion of the gospel. That's quite a statement, as expressed in what we had known as last generation theology. Of course, there will be a last generation according to Adventist theology, but he saw this theology as the gushing fountain of our corruption of the eternal gospel. That's quite a challenge. His cure for the problem was, of course, to adopt an upgraded version of the Reformation doctrine on justification, understood as what is called inaugurated eschatology or realized eschatology, something that is supposed to happen in the future but has already happened now or in the past. So, uh, in other words, he claimed that the final judgment of the saints takes place at the, before the faith life lived and not following it. This came like a bombshell, I have to admit, for a large part of our church, those who live can remember. And I see Duda is nodding his head down there. Uh, it was a wake-up call for me. I was at Andrews University in those years uh, doing my pre-doctoral studies. I remember the day when I stepped down the library stairs of the, at, Undu, at Andrews University. I was reflecting on what Desmond Ford was teaching and a question arose in my mind. Uh, if he is right, how can Adventism have a future? Is it e either, is it, is it, is it a valid a faith system? Because, you know, <clears throat> it's building on a mistake, mistaken reading of prophecy, leading to a subversion of the gospel. What kind of future does such a theology have if it is to be called Christian? However, I decided that I was not going to abandon anything because of what he was saying. Uh, I needed to know for myself. So I decided to explore this problem. To make a long story short, the Ford crisis is actually the incident that kick-started my search into the divisive issue regarding the Adventist teachings on the final judgment and justification. A study that crystallized eventually into my dissertation uh, with a focus on the doctrine of the final judgment and justification of the saints as understood by Adventists compared to that of Lutheran orthodoxy. This was the search that I engaged in. Here it should be noted that the acclaimed recovery of biblical eschatology remains the raison d'etre for Adventism. Without it, we do not exist. That is the reason for the very existence of this kind of movement and theology. We often overlook the simple fact that 
that traditional Christianity thinks redemption in a very different paradigm that we generally do. Different, uh, within a very different salvation historical meta-narrative uh, than that of Adventism. Uh, we often overlook that divide. We try to close it, but it's there. Uh, and Adventism tends to align the order of salvation, that is, the elements and steps in human salvation, you know, uh, differently from that of traditional Christianity. That's what they do. Uh, recently, I read a newspaper article, and sometimes good to read that, about various hopes for the future that are, that are uh, among those hopes were, of course, articulated, what is the Christian hope? And a Lutheran minister expressed the Christian hope as follows. And I quote him because he actually, actually sums it up very neatly. The translation is mine, of course. The early Christians, he says, generally shared the Jewish apocalyptic expectations as is expressed in the book of Daniel and elsewhere. While the Christian hope at that time is focused on the return of Christ, and linked to the renewal of the earth. So he was very clear, early Christians had, should I say, a restorationist eschatology. We are moving from paradise lost to paradise restored. From the first earth to a new earth. This is the paradigm in which the early Christians were thinking. This will change, he says, as the church established itself in the year around 300 AD. So what happened 300 AD? This is where Christianity had come of age. The church has matured, and the Emperor Constantine, he elected himself to be the head of the church and the Christian religion, and the rest is history. And he says here the following, to say it in a simplified way, the hope of following Jesus into the heavenly world, and thus the idea of an eternal life in the beyond came to dominate. So much so for a Lutheran pastor. He says, yeah, there was an initial hope. It changed radically after 300 years. And we have a very different story on the table. Now, where he is himself, he was a third place himself. Some kind of existential hope of some kind I cannot define here. At first sight, we may not think that this makes any real difference. Whether we imagine that we go to heaven when we die or at the return of Christ. Or whether we think that our ultimate destiny is an otherworldly existence in a heavenly beyond. Or we think that it is a restored life on a renewed planet earth. After all, does this change in eschatology really make that practical difference? As long as you go to a better place, who bothers? So what, why, why make a big deal out of this? This is really what it's about. However, when you take a closer look at this and how it plays out in Christian thinking and systemic Christian thinking, uh, you are in for a surprise. This is the most, sub, I would say it's the most transformative event that has ever occurred in the Christian faith. Nothing is bigger than that. It really changes the game and the thinking completely. It changes the perception of human destiny. Where are we going? Um, it changes the perception of human identity. Who are we? Spirit being or body beings, who are we? Because if we are going beyond into a timeless, spaceless beyond, who are we? It changes the perception of the goal of redemption. And even worse, it changes our perception of how humans are eventually be saved. Now, because it will change the way you imagine and understand Christ's redemptive work, past, present, and future. And uh, it will be very different pattern when you compare the Adventist view of this with that of traditional Christianity. It makes a world of difference. It leads to two different hopes for the future, two different destinies. That's what it does. 
The big question is, is salvation history a journey from an earthly paradise life form now lost to an otherworldly life form in a heavenly beyond, non-physical, whatever, following the moment of death? Or is it a journey from an earthly paradise life form now lost to an earthly paradise life form restored following the return of Jesus Christ? Is that what the journey is about? Now, if the ascension story, as I call it, the one you go up into a heavenly beyond at the moment of death, then the entire apostolic teachings regarding the future, eschatology as we call it, the future judgment, uh, that is the return of Jesus, the resurrection from the dead, you name it, whatever is in the pipeline here, even the rebirth of planet Earth is completely eclipsed and superseded superfluous, and if you want to talk about it, you have to reinterpret it. You really can't take it seriously anymore. It's a very different ball game. In that context, it makes little or no sense to speak about a future eschatological redemptive work of Christ on the day of judgment, at the resurrection, at the return, because there are no such things. So you'll have to amputate that part of the teaching and change it and reinterpret it radically. You have no choice. If you still maintain some logic consistency in your way of thinking, you're forced to do it. And um, the kind of speech does not fit into the dominant Christian narrative. What you meet in Adventism doesn't really fit in. The, the problem could be likened uh, to a house. If you say theology and theological system is like a big house with many rooms and stairs and, uh, and, and, and levels, etc., etc. It could be lightened with a house with several rooms fitted with appropriate furnitures. If you reshape the house and you remodel the rooms or tear down part of the building, then you will have to rearrange, at least, or you will have to remodel some of the furnitures uh, to fit the change shape of the house. Even more so, you had to throw out some furnitures because there is no further use of them. In the house, they simply don't fit anymore. The same thing happens in the world of thinking. And the same thing happens when you begin to think holistically about the Christian faith. You will have to do that. And that's exactly what has happened. If we reshape the biblical narrative, we will inadvertently need to rethink the redemptive word of Jesus Christ to fit into the larger or changed meta-narrative in which we live. We have no choice but to do it. And um, as we seek to recover biblical eschatology, we cannot simply, in an unreflected way, adopt the theological furnitures that once fitted a different house and then reset them into a new house called Adventism and uh, maintain them as they were. We need to revise those furnitures, rethink them, and uh, understand what they're really up to within a different biblical perspective. With this comment, I want to proceed. However, that is exactly what Desmond Ford was proposing to do. He decided that he needed to revise Adventist eschatology so it fits the redemptive paradigm of the past, a Lutheran paradigm, a revised Lutheran paradigm, uh, which he believed was a genuine expression and a complete expression of the eternal gospel of the apostles. So in order to maintain what he understood to be a furniture for the past, which was a genuine expression, should I say, of a full redemptive picture in the New Testament, he said we need to revise eschatology. As simple as that. The two things did not fit, so one of them had to go in one way or another. When I stood at the stairs at the library at Andrews University and reflected on what Desmond Ford and others were actually saying, I did not understand the depth of that problem at all. I did not. I only stood there was a problem and Desmond Ford has put his finger on a very sore point within Adventist faith and beliefs. And he has diagnosed a problem that needed some attention. 
a problem that wouldn't simply go away by itself. Either he's right or he's wrong. Or if, he, if he's wrong, then there must be another way forward. And I quite frankly, I didn't have a clue to how this problem would ever be resolved. Only that it was a challenge that is not going to go away. Whatever we try to just, uh, you know, cover it up, it didn't work. But it was a challenge that would not let me go. So I began to investigate. And that is, of course, where it started. I needed to find out, if for nothing else, from my own faith journey. I couldn't live with a both ends. I needed to find some kind of answer, and that was the incentive. So after years of searching and fooling around in key biblical books like Romans, Hebrews, Revelation, which of course were the books that Desmond Ford was using extensively, and historical theology like Martin Luther and Calvin, that gave me an opportunity to read some of these great minds I never read before. You never had time for that when you did your classwork. No, 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 you, you just have to hurry on to the next lecture. And others, including the large field of Adventist literature, which were often confusing, but nevertheless necessary. I finally settled on Ellen White as the most comprehensive and authoritative field in which to search with regard to this question. Since he always appear at the crossroad in the controversies and the critique that has risen again and again and again. Probably to do with the fact that we use her as authority, not just as a source of inspiration. The challenge is, of course, that she, why she believed that behind the scriptural narrative and narratives, there is a deep thematic unity and a system of thought, she generally did not engage in what we call systematics. Although there are chapters in books like the Great Controversy series and other books in which he is involved in what I would call systematic reflection. Nevertheless, I need to characterize her style of being the retelling of the biblical narrative, you know, with substantial reflective comments. I think that's the best way I can say it. Uh, so they needed some systematic approach to this. To make a long story short, I engaged with her teachings and I began to understand that behind her thinking was a deeper logic at, and that she actually operated in a narrative system that was internally coherent and it had deep systematic implications. It was there. It wasn't on the surface necessarily. She clearly began to align the themes of redemption within a larger salvation historical narrative. That's what she did, in which Christ's provision of grace is applied to the believers, past, present, and future, as the story moved forward in stages and finally climax in the restored planet Earth. So she had a, quite a consistent story here with a deep systemic unity in it. It's there. Instead of the judgment being a problem in Ellen White, I discovered that she sees judgment as the very moment in which the divine provision of grace has its ultimate impact for believers, be they living or dead. That's the ultimate impact for believers is coming there. And thus the event in which their redemption will be finally revealed to the universe and confirmed for the universe. It's a very different way of thinking. Remember that in the Middle Ages, we lost the idea that the final judgment was within the sphere of God's provision of grace. It was all purely according to works and the standards of divine holiness. Grace was out of the equation. But the genius of Adventism is they are beginning to say, no, the final judgment is not outside the perimeters or sphere of God's provision of grace. This is a realignment which is unique. You don't find it anywhere else. Her understanding of the celestial ministry of Jesus, past, present, and future, and the application of his provision of grace logically as aligned themselves in a way 
to the story which is different than from the Christian tradition at large. We are saying something that when you say it, other Christians don't quite understand. They think you speak stupid or foolish sometimes. Thus, you could say in the great controversy, I just quote, uh, make that one reference, with regard to the return of Jesus, that when Jesus returns in glory, and all will cry out, including the saints, who can stand? Of course, this is biblical Adventist eschatology, that some and such a day will come. They all cried out. Then everything will go silent, and a voice is heard loud and clear. My grace is sufficient for you. For her, the divine, that's what I discovered. For her, the divine provision of grace, call it forgiving grace, yes, was sufficient today. Yeah, today, tomorrow, and in the judgment, and beyond, even to the great day of the Lord. In her thinking, that's the way it aligns. She never talked about any of these end time events without them being seen and packaged in her larger understanding that there was a provision of grace for everybody. This is amazing. So to make a long story short, uh, when I set out to research the problem diagnosed by Desmond Ford with the hope of resolving it, at least for the sake of my own faith journey, I discovered that I did not resolve it. I did not come up with a constructive solution as we have been taught was the objective of doing systematics. The idea that we can actually constructively go beyond the Bible and say something that God has never said and it would still be true. That's really an arrogant ambition, I agree on that, but that's what we were being taught in classic dogmatics, that's the way it works. I didn't solve the problem, what I experienced was that the problem actually dissolved before my eyes as I studied like mist before a rising sun. That's how it went. I didn't solve it. It dissolved. Once the divine provision of grace and its mode of application is, and its reception is seen in the light of a recovered biblical narrative, eschatology, the problem dissolves. There never were a problem. That's the point. One more observation before I finish. Once we realign the redemptive work of Jesus with the biblical salvation historical narrative understood as a real restoration story, that is a journey from paradise lost to paradise restored, then we establish what I would call a logical equation in which what was in the beginning, in principle, will equal what comes. There is an equality between the paradise lost and the paradise restored. And you immediately have a benchmark for understanding what God had in mind in the beginning and what he's actually doing in the future. The two corresponds. So uh, what is being restored to the redemptive work of Jesus Christ? Thus, both sides of the equation will hermeneutically illuminate each other. One learn from the other. So when you study the restoration that Jesus is providing in the already of salvation and the not yet, you actually learn something about the kind of world in which God wanted in the beginning. Because that to which you are being restored is that which was. Vice versa. If you look at the beginning story, you learn something about what is going to be restored. What was in the beginning is what is coming. So the two correspond and realign with each other. I just wanted to bring that point in here as well. This is part of my latest reflection and, and reflection on, on certain things. So if the goal of redemption is to restore the paradise life form now lost, uh, <clears throat> Everything must be understood within that equation. So make a long story even shorter. The Christian, yeah, no, it's the other way. Good, thank you. <clears throat> what the apostles, let me jump into it. What the apostles would call the sanctified, the spirit-led, godly life. They do talk that kind of language. Within, the, within this equation is to be understood as the goal of redemption. 
and never as a means of redemption. The Middle Ages have confused the issues, and often what is a means, what is the goal of redemption is often seen as a means of redemption. And that's part of the confusion that the Lutheran or Martin Luther began to encounter. That is a life to which we are being saved and not a life by which we are being saved. Not even in an instrumental sense. The godly life is never a means to redemption. Not even in an instrumental sense. It's the goal of redemption. That's the way it appears. But, uh, but that's not the way things were seen in what we call the medieval narrative. Uh, here it must be argued that the spirit of life is more than a process of restoration, namely a process of advancement into a higher mode of existence, sharing in the life of God himself. Because you are moving not from paradise lost to paradise restored. You are moving elsewhere into some other kind of higher life form. Therefore, it's seen differently. Thus, the process and meaning of the sanctified life became a very explosive battleground, you know, in the Middle Ages, and it erupted in what we call the Reformation. In short, it is my thesis that the fuller recovery of biblical eschatology as a journey from paradise lost to paradise restored will greatly clarify what is the goal of redemption and what are the means of redemption. So it has another service. It also helps to resolve the confusion that exists with what it means and what are ends. It's very clear there is a goal and there are means. It's my thesis that once we understand that the sanctified spirited life, the godly life, is the outcome of time spent in communion with God, this is something we learn in the New Testament from the apostles, then within this equation, as a journey from paradise lost to paradise thought, it's difficult not to think about the original paradise ordinance for such a communion. It's very hard. Holy time was the finishing act of God in paradise. Holy time. That's what it was. Sanctified times. This is the first time you encounter the idea of sanctification in any sense and meaning of the word. We won't go in detail. So we notice that holy time in the subsequent narrative was reserved for one purpose and one purpose only, namely for worship and communion with God in fellowship with fellow believers even to the point where God in a footnote attached to Moses, uh, attached to, he attached to Moses, but attached to the worship commandment given in the 10, made it very clear that holy time would be a perpetual reminder to the Israelite that God is the agent of their sanctification. So when you notice this, then it's difficult not to see holy time as a creation ordinance for the purpose of nurturing human spiritual life through communion with God. There is a connection. Sometimes we haven't seen that connection, but it's there. But it's the equation that forces you into that kind of thinking. Without that equation, you don't see it. You miss it. It's my thesis that the ordinance of holy time does make perfect sense, seen as a creation ordinance, for the purpose of facilitating communion with God, by which God always intended to build to nurture, to uphold, and maintain a human community of love. This was his way of building the kingdom of God. Just for your suggestion. So within a restore, restoration eschatology, holy time fits the order of salvation without any contradiction as part of the life form to which we are being saved not the life form by which we are being saved. Away with any idea that the time you spend with God in communion or Sabbath, whatever you do, is a means that gives you brownie point anywhere in this universe. Your access to communion with God is through Jesus Christ. And without that access, there are no life. So back to my personal journey that began with the research into the Adventist world of thought, seen through the eyes of Ellen White. 
naturally leads into a study of scripture, the biblical world. If for no other reason that the methodological claim in Adventism is that Adventism should be biblical and not based on any other source or authority. So uh, if you want to know if there is any meaning in what you lead in Ellen White, you need to go elsewhere. You can't believe it just because she says it, nor can you accept it because there is a coherent unity in her thought. It could still be a wrong story. It's all possible. And in academic incentive to pursue such a study of the biblical world to a thematic, analytic, thematic approach came from a man called Walter Kaiser, Walter Kaiser Jr. He visited Andrews University in 1978, nine, somewhere around that time, gave a 30-minute lecture uh, for our students in which he outlined a method for recovering the deeper meta-narrative in scripture. That's what he did. You can read his book if you want. Namely to trace the theme of promise as the one, prom one theme that unifies the entire story from the Old Testament to the New. That's his main argument. Now the basic claim of Walter Kaiser is that scripture embodies a grand unifying theme despite any diversity. And he's not the first one to suggest that. Uh, but it was a very bold stance in the in the 1960s and 70s, especially in view of the fact that this idea was deeply challenged by the rising higher biblical criticism and its basic claim. Whatever good it has given us in terms of critical analysis, it raised the basic claim that the biblical material is a fusion of diverse, even contradictory traditions. There are no unity without any coherence or unity whatsoever. And in the department, when we had our seminars, we often discussed this, because it seems that the business we were in in systematic theology was hopeless. It was simply rendered impossible if that's the way the Bible is. What do you do? If there are no deep coherency or unity or anything like that in scripture, the whole business of systematics is impossible. So in the field of systematics, we have to resort to philosophy or philosophical speculation. And that is the way it has mostly been done in the past, we should remind ourselves. And a professor actually challenged me and said, what philosophy have you chosen as a means of constructing a system of theology? And all the red lights and blue lights began to flash before me because that, I wasn't prepared for that. I mean, I did not see light in this suggestion. So uh, the proposed should I say, the thesis proposed by Walter Kaiser was a very welcome alternative. I received it as an alternative saying, I will explore that line of thought. If the other one seems impossible, I'll try this. So I began to explore the alternative, how to let the Bible tell its own story on its own premises. He actually opened for me the field of biblical theology, that is the pursuit of a thematic narrative analysis and study of the advancing biblical story. It's logic and rationale. In that journey, I discovered that embedded in the biblical text, despite any diversity and their specific topical focus or whatever, there is a grand meta narrative unfolding in progressive stages, unfolding a grand system of thought forming a coherent worldview in its own right. I didn't need to go elsewhere to find that worldview. It was already there, embedded in the biblical story. Again, it's a situation when I did not resolve the problem of, uh, so, you know, that was facing the field of doing systematics. No. I simply saw the problem dissolve before my eye. That's what happened. Many years later, while being teacher here at Newburgh College, I encountered the works of N.T. Wright, Greg Bartholomew, and a whole list of others I don't need to mention here, who are spearheading a narrative and analytic thematic approach to biblical theology and to whom I owed a deep gratitude and they have provided a lot of helpful material for the pioneering work that they have done 
in the field of biblical theology, which I call the missing link in theology between exegesis and systematics. They do not exclude each other, but we have a missing link. We are not engaging in a thematic, analytic, should I say, approach to the text and the story as a whole. Therefore, we miss the big system. But we don't need to go beyond the confines of Adventism to meet this approach that was embedded in early Adventism if we care to look. Something apart from which Adventism would never have emerged in the first place. It wouldn't have done that. As Ellen White suggests in her book, Education, that below the surface of the text there is a grand system of thought not detectable by mere plain reading. So much for plain reading. But discovered by the effort of tracing the great themes of scripture which, it, which makes up the great systemic whole and which are unified by one central theme of promise unfolding in Jesus Christ. So it's not new, it's not alien, it's inherent, it's part of our DNA to try that route and this approach. This observation by Ellen White reminds me of a dream by William Miller, which she recorded in her book, Early Writings. William Miller also spoke about the scriptural narrative and spoke the great system, a grand system of truth. In this dream, he saw scripture that is a collection of precious stones and jewels which emitted light like the sun in their own right as they stand. However, over time humans would scatter the jewels and the precious stones, even making fake ones, and then bury all of it in all kinds of rubbish and dirt, put out the light. But eventually, at the end time, God will take action sweep the rubbish, gather the jewels and the pearls, and reset them anew. And when they thus are reset, they will shine, they will shine with ten times the glory they have emitted before. What he is after in this dream, and what she is after is that below the surface of the text, there is a grand story, a much bigger story. And once you begin to see all the jewels in that context, they will shine with more power than you've ever seen before. That, of course, aligns with Ellen White's vision that someday in the run-up to the return of Jesus Christ, finally the world will be enlightened. Yes, what a vision. I do not claim that I have seen all of that. That's not what I'm trying to say today. But in reflecting on my own journey, I confess that the narrative, thematic, analytic study of scripture with a divine promise at its central theme as unfolded in Jesus Christ has made the jewels and the pearls of scripture shine with a light that far transcends any plain reading as it reveals that the scriptures embody a grand narrative and system of thought which provides a birth eye view, a telescopic view of life, existence, and everything that follows. And which really dissolves many of the problems that now occupied our minds and threatens to split us apart. They're there. Problems like the one that was exposed by Desmond Ford as he diagnosed a real problem. Let's admit it. There was a real problem in traditional Adventist thought as it was flying around in our churches. Uh, on eschatology and salvation, it may very well have been a needed shake-up in our thinking, at least it was for me. That's the way it is. It was a challenge to reinvestigate the grand story, a story that has an explanatory power far beyond our limited human horizon. That's what it did for me. And the occasion was this fort. Now, I never went his way, not at all. But he became an incentive to make a pursuit that I had never planned and never imagined and never had any inkling of idea what to find. It's a light in front of which are confusions, and shallow understandings will evaporate like mist before a rising sun. 
I am convinced that the way into this great light, light, that is the way we actually read, is also the way forward until the kingdom come. In conclusion, the recovery of biblical narrative eschatology as a journey from paradise lost to paradise restored is the great game changer in Christian beliefs. It is. We never appreciate the legacy that we are sitting on. It might be wrong, I don't think it is, but if it's true, we have a duel here and we should not be ashamed of it. It's the great dividing line in classical Christianity. There are two great stories that are meeting each other in the arena of human beliefs. They're there, whether we know it or not. Two different destinies, two different stories, two different hopes for the future. This is what we see before our eyes. Thank you. Thank you, Gunnar, for this um, retrospective, at the same time forward-looking, um, um, provocative, and, um, um, and reflective um, uh, speech. Thank you. Now, as I said, I reserve some time for some questions. So if you really have a burning question, this is the time to ask. Dr. Lazic. Uh, so uh, sometimes 20 years ago almost, I was sitting in your class and I always felt like uh, after your class, like coming the, uh, climbing the Mount Everest from which all the other mountains would be seen. So you, uh, you have a special gift as you speak picture and I'm always touched by that. And I think it's really up my faith every time as a student, but also now. Now, you, today, um, you were talking about how the devil force tried to selectively baptize the Luther perspective uh, on the expense of Andrew's eschatology. And then and there was another attempt in the previous century by Emil Andreasse who tried to baptize the Wesleyan yeah. thought and again clashed with Andrew's eschatology. And so, so I feel that this synthesis between soteriology and eschatology didn't yet happen fully in our church. So when I hear, when I, when I write, even read the official church writings, so on, they're still there, Lutheranism, Wesleyanism sneaking out, and uh, I can see the synthesis still is not consolidated in Andrew's mind. If you are to give the future advice to the colleagues coming behind you, uh, who would like to uh, give their voice there and devote their life to actually do the synthesis, to explore this, this diamond, as you call it, this pearl that Andrew is bringing on, what would those, this advice be for the future of this synthesis? All right, I hope I got everything you were saying. Please correct me if I'm beginning to give an answer, you know, you asked in the, in the West and I answer in the East because my hearing a little bit impaired. So I'm sorry about that. But you did ask, you did talk about, could you restate the last thing yeah, one last more time? Be... Come to the mic. Yeah, so yeah. if you were, uh, if you were, so, if you are to envision the future yes. of this synthesis between yes. soteriology and eschatology yes. and the unfinished job of Adventism, yes. Yes. Uh, what advice would you give to younger colleagues who come after you trying to wrestle with this synthesis? Okay, so what could question. help in that process? What would help in doing that? Well, the first help and advice is to begin to engage in biblical theology. I mean, first of all, you need to understand what is going on, what the issues are. So you need to be well acquainted with the systematic issues. But the solution to it, if you want to wrestle with it, I mean, you need to engage in what I call biblical theology. And this is the way forward. This is the way forward I discovered that kind of dissolves the tension and unites exegesis and systematics in a very beautiful way. In, in the middle of the road, which is basically thematic analysis. And I think it's possible. We need to understand what biblical eschatology is, the various stage. It's a journey from two, and it has stages, right? 
and it progresses in stages. N.T. Wright would tell you about these stages. It's there. He's done a lot of pioneering work, so it's not just on my authority and my shoulders, but it's very helpful because you need to understand that the provision of grace or salvation is, uh, need to be realigned with that. You need to understand how the provision of grace will work on each state in that journey and not uh, leave a gaping hole as Adventism did in the beginning. And there are lots of reasons why this happened, but not our own fault, not at all. We were born in the Wesleyan tradition with this heavy emphasis on uh, entire sanctification and perfection and became even more radical with the rise of the holiness movements, I mean, and so on. And, and, and the things were going apart. So when Adventism was born, it was born into a crypt that worked with a Wesleyan paradigm. I know that a man like uh, uh, George Knight, uh, he says we lost basic Christianity at some juncture in our journey. I would say no, we were never born in it. We were born in the Wesleyan paradigm, which had an inherent bend towards perfectionism. And Adventism arose with the need to achieve that perfection. But our changed eschatology changed the game of the, of the play. And we ended up in a heavy perfectionism at some times. We never really understood exactly how the provision of grace will work for you today, tomorrow, in the judgment, and beyond into the kingdom come. God has a provision, this is what I'm discovering, that is so broad, so solid, so sound, that it provides for the entire journey. We need to understand how that works. So I say biblical theology, back to the drawing board again, again and again and again, because our minds are already prepped, so to speak, with all kinds of systematic theologies, and language is flowing around which have their origin in a different story than the one, should I say, which is really biblical. So uh, there is a challenge. It's not as easy as we think. We are a restoring movement, or should I say, a recovering movement. And we are trying to go where no one has really been going for the last 1,500 years. It's not easy. But my experience so far has been that whenever I do make a discovery on that journey, I end up with a big mountain of understanding. And who do you think I meet up there? Among anybody else, the Apostle Paul. And he turns around and he asks me, what took you so long? I have been here for the last 2,000 years. Yeah, just a suggestion. Yeah. Thank you. I'm also mindful of the time. And um, I think you finished with a beautiful appeal to <clears throat> uh, Paul. Um, can we proceed to um, um, two speeches um, um, of thanks to you, Gunnar? Yes, I, I think this is part of the seminar, Gunnar. Uh, Steve, please. First of all, Gunnar, I'd like to say thank you very much for that presentation. I thoroughly enjoyed it. It sort of brought us back to old times, but we're in the wrong building. It was the opportunity to be able to listen to you as you reflect and think and provide profound wisdom. I'd also like to thank Elizabeth for coming, Torsten, Eben and Michael. You've given me a very rich image. You know, I'm probably one of the few that actually heard Des Ford in person back in the 70s. And I, I can hear that rattle gun going off and the two days to digest. We haven't had a rattle gun this afternoon, but I think we've got more than two days to digest. But the image that you've given me, I can just see you standing at the top of those stairs in the Andrews Library, asking that question. If Des is right, what is the future of Adventism? And it would have been asked in Danish, it would have been audible, but very quiet. I have often valued the way in which you can think 
outside and keep on just expressing and challenging those ideas as you do that. Amongst the great wisdom we've had this afternoon, I hope you've heard a phrase that I heard at least twice. I didn't solve it. The problem just dissolved in front of me. I think that's a great statement about the humility of the great wisdom that you share with us. The humility that you have when you actually come and engage in these incredible thoughts. I want to thank you not only for this afternoon, but I want to thank you for the 17 years of teaching at Newbold. That was while he was paid. There's been another 12 years after that. Almost 30 years of your life has been here for students and staff. Thank you. There's one phrase that Narisa and I always associate with you. And that's a phrase that we again heard this afternoon. And I'm quoting from a song by John Moore. And may those who come behind us find us faithful. That's an incredible challenge to each one of us here. Jan, I'd also like to thank you for organising this afternoon and all the work that's gone into it behind the scenes. We appreciate it greatly. I have also invited... Um, Dr. Ivan Milanov, on behalf of the CMM, uh, to say a few words of thanks. Dr. Peterson, uh, in the name of the department and my personal name, I would like to say a big thank you, uh, not just for uh, your presentation today, as Dr. Caro pointed out, but for your hard work for our students and for the department as well. The other day I asked you uh, what is the most enjoyable part of your retirement? And you responded to say no. <laughs> However, whenever Newbold College asks you for any assistance or help, you never said no. And we are so grateful to you, to Mrs. Peterson, because Dr. Peterson would not be possible without Mrs. Peterson. We are so grateful to your son, Thorsten, to your daughter and her husband, Michael, uh, that they support you, inspire you, and from time to time probably criticize you. Uh, also, I would like to acknowledge that you have uh, influenced dozens and dozens of students. Uh, probably half of our department today have been your students. And the other half uh, were probably uh, so sorry that we were not your students. However, I am very personal, grateful, uh, uh, thankful to you uh, because in 2007, 
you just ask my doctoral supervisor, Dr. Turner, is there anyone who can teach the book of Daniel? And uh, you chose me and Dr. Turner. Uh, he called me, I accept that, and since that time I've been teaching at Newbold College. So I've never crossed my foot in your classroom, but you definitely influenced my life. So I'm so personally grateful to that. And so we wish you many happy returns to Newbold College. You're always welcome, and please postpone this no to Newbold College as much as you can. Thank you. Um, there is time, <clears throat> as the wise preacher says, for everything. There is time to present presentations. There is time to listen. There is time to write books. And there is time to think. And there is time, good night, to receive books. I'm sorry that we hid the real purpose of this event before you, Gunnar. <clears throat> but um, there is something that we wanted to surprise you with, your family, um, your colleagues. And it is with great pleasure, Gunnar, <clears throat> that the college, the church, your colleagues can present to you a celebratory volume for your work. I think we can project it on the screen as well. Well, 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 well. I like the title. <laughs> a Quest for Biblical Theology, Fest Script in Honor and Good of Peterson. So uh, at least the title is good. <laughs> and, uh, I'm looking forward to read it and see what you have come up with. I thought there was a conspiracy going on here. <laughs> you were very modest in the way you did it, Jan. I mean, inviting me for this lecture it should just, I should just speak my heart, and it was not so important, 20 minutes, whatever, you know. And uh, it was a small event in a small classroom somewhere. I did not know what you were up to, but I began to smell a rat when my family was invited as well. Something was on, but I didn't know that it was it. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um. Yes, um, lots of work has gone behind to actually present this work to you, and I'd like to thank, thank many people who are also in the book, the contributors, your former colleagues, uh, some present colleagues, um, people like John Beldam, who's done incredible background work for editing, and he couldn't quite finish the last chapter. Uh, thank you uh, to Lawrence Turner, who stepped in to do some editing. Thank you to um, jean quil Hall, who's done the final proofread of the book. Thank you to Manfred Lemke, who has been incredibly working hard to actually make this happen on time. Um, but uh, we want to thank our God as well, and I have invited Dr. Daniel Duda to say the final prayer. Before you go and before the prayer finishes and you say amen, let me just also invite you to chit-chat with Dr. Peterson. There are some refreshments outside of the Salisbury Hall, so all of you are also um, invited. Gunnar, Lisbeth, all of you. In business world, you get a nice fat bonus at the end of the year. We don't do this in the church. We can't have a golden handshake for you. But the way we celebrate a contribution of someone in the area of theology is through presentation of a festschrift as a deep and significant gesture. So let me express on behalf of the church and the Trans-European Division the amazing appreciation for the, word, for the work that you, and influence that you had on students, colleagues, and the broader theological community. We are so proud of you that you have been able to take the work of Hans Karl Arundel 
the Dutch theologian and take it further than he or Diderot were ever able to do, and that 17 plus 12 years of your work have been connected with Newbold College. Your dedication to teaching, mentoring, as well as your ability to inspire students, colleagues, and challenge us to think deeply about theological questions and Adventism was astounding. The first time I met Gunnar Peterson was when I came for the job interview in 98, and he was on the panel that interviewed me. And you scared me to death. <laughs> he asked me the question, so what do you think you can contribute to our students here? I don't remember what I said to that, some rambling question, some rambling answer, because I did not expect that question. But I often reflected on that one. I reflected in my job at Newbold when I was offered it. I reflected when I went to the division. I reflected when I was asked to be the TED president. That question of yours is still with me. And then I had the amazing opportunity to be a colleague with Gunnar. We used to have a joke that the systematic theology at Newbold never sleeps. Because when I went to bed, Gunnar was getting up. And so we had amazing eight years together as colleagues. I have learned so much from you. I have valued the perspective. I have grown as a person, as a theologian. And thank you for that. My only regret of those days is that Sabbath afternoon, I was so tired often, if I could bring that time back, I would go for those walks with you and listen to your thinking and interpretations because there was a time to learn more. So let me conclude with a heartfelt expression of gratitude for your dedication, for your wisdom, for the impact that you had on students, colleagues, and the larger, wider Seventh-day Adventist Church, not only in Europe, but worldwide. We are so proud that we have been part of this journey together with you. Let's pray. Our gracious Lord, we are so thankful that you have not abandoned any one of us and that through the impact of personal impact of individuals, you create a multifaceted community that reflects something about your character, your love, and that our lives have been touched and transformed by your grace through the ministry of Gunnar Peterson. And we ask for your blessing not only on him, his family, but on his students, colleagues, on the current students of Newbold College, the current faculty, and we pray that his influence is multiplied for the future, for the glory of your name, so that the knowledge of who you are and your character will cover the earth as the waters cover the sea. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you for coming. And um, don't consider this as the close of the event. As I said, there are some refreshments outside. And you are welcome to uh, help yourselves and also to talk to Gunnar and also chit chat among ourselves. There are five copies of the book which are not for sale, which are not for taking, but for viewing. Let me emphasize this. Um, the book is on Amazon for sale from today. Um, so you will be able to eventually get it, and you will be able to get it through the college as well. There will be means of distribution, but the copies we have, we, we got for this event, they are for display, for viewing, and um, yeah, not for taking. Thank you.